As I bring us back to our, our, our message this morning, I want us to think about work. Work. We all work. Um, we've all had to do work a lot in our life, and one of the things about work is we we need the result of our labor to be encouraged. So when I'm mowing the grass, I need to be able to look back at least after 30 minutes or so and see the nice little smooth little rows of, of tracks from the, the mower, right? If we clean the house, you want to look back and see the vacuum tracks in the carpet. You want to see the shiny floors. It would be discouraging if you worked in the heat, especially like this unseasonable heat we're experiencing. And you look back and you still saw a shabby lawn. Or if you worked hard to clean the house and after about an hour you looked and it was still just as dirty. It'd be really hard to be motivated, right? Now we know there's some kind of work that's like that. My brother-in-law is an example who married my oldest sister, Woody. He's developed a lot of uh, land, including the Albemarle Plantation in Edenton, North Carolina, it's the boating golfing community. And he's learned in his work that he's had to not think in terms of days, but in terms of seasons when it comes to the profit when it comes to the reward of his labor, because, you know, all the obstacles, including the economy and stuff, and this is a retirement kind of thing, and he's, he's just gotten through on the, on the realization, I can't look every day for my reward. Now, the reason I bring that up is because the work that God calls us to do is that way. We're talking about loving God as the first step in our assimilation pathway. And one of the ways today that we're going to realize that we, learn, that we love God is we work. We work. He's called each one of us to do some kind of labor. And the thing about his work is very different from ours. We can't produce the result. Only he can. And he only does it in his time. It's a mystery. Sometimes it's every day. It's like, wow, amazing. And then other times you could go a year and, and just be waiting on God for the result. And you can't help when you're doing the work to look for the result. It's a natural thing. It's built in. But you won't be able to, to sustain encouragement and strength and inspiration if you're depending on the results with God. Because you can't produce them yourself. You can't say, well, if God's not going to do it, I'm just going to do it. Because I can't stand it anymore. i got to make this thing happen that, that I'm doing with God. He's like, nope, only I can do the result. You just labor with me, and I'll do the result in my, in my time. Now, what are we talking about? What are some examples? Parenting, parenting children. This is one of the things God calls many of us to do. Raise children for me. Launch them into the world one day. Right? I know my mom was called to do that with me. And most of the time that she was doing her key work for me, I was a record stinker. I didn't even know she was there until I was in 10th grade. I didn't even recognize all the sacrifice that she was given to me. And I didn't show any spiritual promise and, and even have a spiritual pulse until 10th grade. And by that time, her work was pretty much over. She would still love me. She would still be my friend. She would still be important in my life, still pray for me, of course. But the launching and the foundation had to be there when I was slamming the door, when I was not saying thank you, when I was just totally not getting anything. Uh, she had to love God and do that for some other reason than the result. And she couldn't get inside me and believe for me. She couldn't just say, well, God, I'm so sick of this. I'm ready for my children to turn out well. And I am working, 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 and they are still very bad. And my siblings are even worse than me. <laughs> and there were five of us. And, but my mom loved us well. And we re we, we've all re re risen up and called her blessed. But when she had to do the work, believe me, we were not complimenting her. And we were not. So that's just one example. What about seeking to lead our family and our friends to Jesus who don't know him? And God says, yeah, come work with me. Share your faith and be an example and hope move them along into the next step and all that. And you do that and you do that and you think, man, when are they going to ever respond? And to, you get in conversations and, and, and they don't want to talk or whatever it is. And you keep praying and, and, and you're doing this labor. You're making this effort to befriend and to seek to invite them to church, whatever it is. And only God can move that along. And uh, so it can be very discouraging because we're used to doing labor and having the result and seeing the result. And when we don't, when we can't produce it and when only God can do that in his time, 
Uh, it's easy to get discouraged. Giving financially is another way that we do God's work because it's our time and it's our energy and it represents that. And we come and we support God's work. We talked about this last week. And we hear promises that God will make it worth our while and that he'll add to our life satisfaction and productivity if we honor him like that in an appropriate way. And so maybe we begin to give and it's a big effort and we're looking for those stories. We're checking the mailbox for the miraculous check and doesn't come. And it just seems like a loss. It seems like another bill we're paying. And it's easy to get discouraged. It's a bigger need than making God's work a priority is staying encouraged once you start the work. The people last week in our story in the book of Haggai, they were, they were leaving God out of their life. And um, God had to speak to them to make him a priority. And he did that. And only God can do that for all of us. Hey, make my work a priority. Do my work. But there's an even greater need, and he throws his name around even more in the message today. Because you have to hear it from him, not from me, to make God's work a priority. But also, once you start working, just to stay encouraged. It's so easy to get discouraged when you work and when you do God's work. And so the whole message today is, is on that. So if you came today and you're discouraged, you came on a red day. <laughs> The Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty wants to refresh your soul and breathe courage and breathe inspiration back into your soul because he knows it's even harder to keep doing his work than it is to start doing it. It's even harder, you know, to keep encouraged than it is to overcome selfishness. And, uh, and, 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 and what are even some other ways that we do his work? <laughs> Creating a welcoming atmosphere through our greeting team, mentoring someone from a broken home, visiting those in hospital or, or the prison, serving and volunteering in our children's ministry, in our youth ministry, in any of these ministries, you look and you begin to say, as God's called me into this, when is something going to happen? I, I, it's hard to keep it up. Uh, and to the extent that we know that there is going to be a result and our spirit is hopeful, we will work. But to the extent that we're discouraged that we've worked for however long, maybe a month or two or a year or two, or maybe we worked a long time in our life ago and, and everything else, but to the extent that now we are inactive or we are struggling to do anything or we just feel paralyzed in our, in our energy and ourself, to that extent we are discouraged. If you are not as active today in God's work as you were at some other time in your life, then it's very possible you may be discouraged. And I'll say it the other way, if God and his Holy Spirit and today in this message, if it, if it comes through to your heart, you will work. You will work as you never worked before in your life. And it all comes from your belief and your inspiration that he will bring those results in his time. And so it's with that perspective uh, that we come to our passage. You remember it was 2,500 years ago. Okay, it was God's people, but they weren't a church. They were a nation and they had been blessed and great under David and Solomon and all that. But then for hundreds of years, they forgot God for hundreds of years. They sinned against him. They had evil kings. They went after idols and God, after many years of patience, uh, le uh, led them into captivity. And then after 70 years, just 50,000, a small ragtag refugee remnant came back. By his gracious provision in the Persian Empire, they brought materials back to Jerusalem, which had been destroyed completely. And they began to rebuild the temple. And um, they got it going, and they got the foundation laid, and they had this big dedication service. And then their neighbors did not want that to happen, and they opposed them, and as a result, the people quit. And they spent all that material then on their own homes, and they let God's house lay in ruin for 15 years. And Haggai shows up. That was last week. He came, and he said, you know, make my house a priority. Go up in the mountains, get materials, and build my house. They did. That's how the chapter ended. But now they have a, a new challenge, and that is described as we open the passage in the first few verses. Um, and I'll be reading these verses as we go under each point. So let's read the first three verses. 
Haggai chapter 2. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. To Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. And to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Does it not seem to you like nothing? God addresses specifically the older ones in this passage. Zerubbabel the governor, Josedak the high priest. We're old enough, and, and some of the other main leaders. 70, 80 years old, at least, to, to remember before the captivity and the destruction of Jerusalem. And they remembered Solomon's temple and all of its glory. And so uh, this problem actually occurred when they were building the foundation 15 years previously. When they were laying the foundation, here's a reference from Ezra 3. And verse 11, and all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept out loud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sounds of the shouts of joy from the sound of the weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard from far away. And now that they restarted the work 15 years later, they got the same mix. They got the young men who are working, who've never known anything to compare it to in the past. They're just so glad to be building a useful place to experience God in this. And so they're so happy. But these older men are still looking at that and they're comparing it to Solomon's temple and its former glory. And, and, and just as much as these younger men are encouraged, they're discouraged. This is why they quit 15 years ago. It wasn't just the neighbor's opposition. It was, they were already so, so discouraged at the result. They could see the foundation and they could immediately begin to compare. And there was so much guilt already because they knew that it was their own failure as a nation that they weren't in that former glory when they had 12 tribes and they had, they had, they had riches and tread. And it was their golden age. And Solomon had, had, had uh, not, spared no expense and built it to the nines. And it, and it was silver and gold. And it was was expensive exotic wood and fabric and and now it's low budget wood and cement and it's just like there's only 50,000 of us and and look at our nation it's just gone and it's all our fault because because we, we've just failed God and and so there's the shame mixed in it with with it and 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 they're comparing what is to the glory days to the former days and as a result they're discouraged and you know the old men you know, like the father of the family or the grandfather of the family that everybody kind of looks over to to see if he's laughing? Everybody kind of looks over and says, what would you say to a question or a challenge? When they are discouraged, everybody sort of picks it up. Everybody feels it. And conversely, when an old man is really passionate, it's something good. It's really hard to do that. Well, what is it? It's not a fad. It's not a flash in the pan. It's not a pep talk from a coach. It's not like a drill sergeant that can just intimidate you. What is it, old man, that stood the test of time? What is it that's got you passionate? And, and, and you find out what it is, and it's got to be some amazing thing. Amazing thing. And in this case, the, the old men are discouraged, and God comes through Haggai and says, I'm going to speak to you. If you've served the Lord, and you're looking at what you're doing, and you're like, it's not that good. It's not as good as it used to be. You know, comparisons are devastating. You read about success of other people. You know, Mary shares her faith and 25,000 people came to the Lord. You know, it's like, no one ever does when I do. So-and-so I read and it seems like their life is one miracle after the other. Or, or we compare our church to another church that's maybe just exploding with numbers and growth. And, or maybe you even compare to some time in your own life compared to the current present time. Whatever it is, comparisons are to me, compared to someone else, compared to some time. Other, there, you can't, it'll devastate you to compare. But we do. And especially older people do. And we can't help the results and the seasons of life as they come and go. And there's so much out of our control. And we say, well, it was really exciting then. And, and now, ugh. And God wants to come. And he wants to speak. 
and he wants to talk to you. And if you get what he's saying, you're going to work. You're going to work with all your heart as you never had before, no matter what's happening around you. And his, his message is strong and good enough to encourage the old seasoned veterans. It's deep, it's lasting, it stood the test of time. And so that's the challenge. Uh, and now the message comes and it starts in verse four, the first part of the verse with a command, be strong and work. As God begins to speak through the prophet Haggai, we, we look at verse four a and we read it, but now be strong Zerubbabel declares the Lord, be strong Joshua. Son of Josedach, the high priest, be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. Three times the Lord Almighty says, be strong, be strong, be strong, be strong. And I'll just tell you, now that we're in the new covenant, according to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3, the tablets of the Lord do not contain the commands of God. They are written on our hearts, no longer on tablets of stone and make us feel guilty, lifting no finger to help us. When you hear God command you now in the New Testament, in the new covenant, his spirit writes the command on your heart. Now, it's so important with this particular command because he's dropping his name six times on the Lord Almighty and he's saying at the same time to his people, be strong. The closest, dearest, seasoned saints that are his veterans, be strong, be strong, be strong. I'm not giving you a pep talk. I'm giving you my power. Ephesians 6 verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power which he gives you to wear like armor. His power. And so if you hear this message from the Lord of hosts and, not, and the Lord Almighty, not from me, getting through to your heart first, he's saying to you, be strong. And when he does, it's possible. His command is expected because he enables that command. He's saying, be strong. And then he turns around, he's ready to give you the power. Weak, but I'm weak, but I'm discouraged, but I can't, I'm paralyzed. I can't lift a finger. I, I get winded just, just barely thinking about doing your work, God, because it's just so heavy and discouraging. He's like, he's like, no, I know, I know. I'm, I'm the Lord, and I'm talking to you because you've known me for a long time, and I'm telling you, be strong, and I'll help you. Be strong, and I'm going to give you that power. Be strong. And this is what's so important about loving God. You can't love him if you're not going to experience this power, and this power is there for you. He's saying to you, be strong, be strong, be strong. And then, in the power, we work. Not just be strong, but be strong and work. This is what we do with the power that God gives us. This is what he will empower and sustain. There's a work for each one of us to do, and it's important because that's how we love God. We can read our Bible, we can pray, we can sing, we can worship. All that is so awesome. Wouldn't take away from that one bit, but we'll do that all in, all in heaven. And, uh, but there's one thing that we're gonna do on this earth that we need to finish before we go to heaven. And that's some job, some calling. There are so many examples in the scripture. God reveals himself to somebody and they go, wow. And then he goes, okay, here's something to do. Here's something, I'm calling you to do this for me. And then you'll see me. When you're done, you'll see me in heaven. Tell me how it went. But on your t in, in this time on earth, you're to be doing this thing. And so to love me is to, is to understand this, this work that you're supposed to do and have my strength to do it. And so if you're discouraged, you're missing out on so much of what it means to love me, God says. And so this is about you. Forget the result. This is about you experiencing me and loving me. And to do that, you need to understand I'm ready to empower you. And call you in a fresh way back to some kind of work. Some kind of work. You know, I love John Grisham. He's a best-selling author. He's probably written 30 plus books and probably writes one a year or more. And I listen to him in my car and I just over, uh, I probably listen to his books three or four times. He's a great story. Uh, teller, good, great, great writer. But um, there's millions of people. He's the number one bestseller when his books comes out every, every time. And uh, I think to myself, I thought to myself this week when I was listening to his book all week, I was thinking, what must it be like for him when he writes his new book? He's got a new one coming out. Um, and I think, 
how much joy does he get? How, how important is that to him when he knows millions of people are going to read this book and, and, and how cool. And then I think maybe Thomas Kincaid, the painter of light. And I think, boy, what must it be like to have his sort of studio? And, and, and you look at these beautiful paintings that are sold for, for so much money. And you think, what would it be like for him to paint? Oh my gosh, that would be so much of his life. What if you were hired to work for Google? What if you were recruited by them and you just got that glow on your face? I just got a job with Google. <laughs> You can't disguise it. It's just your face is glowing because you're working for a, one of the number one companies. And you know it's exciting, it's important, and it's going to be challenging, and you're ready to give your best, and you're so excited. And then you hear you lose the job. Or, or John Grisham gets some kind of disability, and he can't create and write anymore. And he has to try to deal with it. It'd be this huge loss in his life because it's such a big deal, I'm telling you. Way more important than Google, way more important than painting and writing books is your Lord. I'm talking to those of you who know the Lord. He has called you. He's recruiting you to discover what that job is and to do that job until you go home. It's got that kind of weightiness, that importance. And if you're not doing it because you're discouraged, you're missing something. <laughs> so it gives me so much excitement and passion to speak for him and have him speak through me like he did Haggai and say, hey, be strong. Work. Work for me. Don't be discouraged. Don't compare to other things. It was never about that. That's up to me. That's the mystery when I do the result. But here, you do the work. I'm ready to empower you. And I've recruited you and called you. Now you do the work for me. And, and then you just begin to discover, oh my gosh, the joy. That's a big part of loving God. The God who saved my soul, who's forgiven my sin, who has blessed me for and provided for me for so long. How did I ever get to comparing and demanding and expecting, oh my gosh, this is back to you, God. Be strong. And work, this is your job. And when you do it, you're at your best spiritually. So that's the command. The message begins with a command to be strong. and work. But then God gives two promises. Uh, again, that could only come from him that are an encouragement to, to his workers, his old veterans who are discouraged. He says, promise number one, I am with you. And this is in the second part of, first four, of verse 4 and verse 5, and we read, For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Repeats it twice, for I am with you, my spirit remains among you. It's so again, and then he brings up a covenant, which is the deepest, most personal, permanent commitment you can make with another party or between two parties. And he's referring to the one he made with them in the book of Deuteronomy, where he said, now, if you disobey me, you'll be let off and then I'll bring you back. Even then I'll remnant. And so God is referring to that. And he's saying, I know you feel bad. I know you feel guilty. I know there's a lot of shame. There's a lot where you're not up to your potential and you know you're just 50,000 instead of a huge, strong nation of people. But I'm still on schedule. He said, I'm still backing up my part of the bargain. I'm still being faithful. Even after hundreds of years of your faithlessness, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still being uh, uh, faithful to my covenant to you. And so it's by grace. It's something we don't deserve. It, that's a big part of our discouragement. Sometimes we think the result is somehow because God has left us and, and the change in the season is because God is not with us as he was in the former day. I had a, a man I'll never forget in Virginia Beach. We had the kids the same age and he, he was just starting to come to our church. He wasn't doing anything. And he started talking to me because my dad had had spoken at his college where he led an organization that, that was a Christian organization. And so he was like, oh, we loved your dad. He was an awesome teacher. And he said, oh man, you wouldn't believe what God did in those days. And he would, he probably three or four times in our friendship, he would tell me how wonderful that was. And he was always in the middle of it, leading it, doing all this great stuff. And I knew it had been about 20 years in the past. And I'm thinking, in my mind, I didn't say this to him, but I'm thinking, why are you talking to me about something 20 years ago? And I don't think you're doing much now. And uh, so I began to pray for him, and sure enough, slowly and surely, he began to lead two small groups in our church. He became an elder. 
And he just got back in. He's like a little kid again, enjoying the ministry. But for him, he had the glory days in his mind, the glow in his eye. And I'll tell you when the Lord was working. And I'll tell you, and it's all this stuff. And then it changed for him. The seasons changed. And so often for God's people, there's no control over that. And then they began to compare and they stop. And, and the Lord's just like saying, hey, I'm still here. And I'll say this to some of us who are older. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, God is still calling you as never before. What are you doing? What are you doing? Do you want to rust out or burn out? Do you want to go out like a little boy, like a little girl, excited more than ever at the adventure of serving God? That's all up to you. But God's like, hey, I am here. I am with you. Now, for some reason, you've not believed that because I've had to tell you that twice and I should go back to the covenant and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, I'm still here even though you've blown it, even though you didn't deserve it. I'm here. And that's what the glory is about. Anyway, I'm thinking back all the times in my life and I can attach it to the specifics that change in my life and the places and the sizes and the shapes and the, and, and the different stories and the results and all that change. And I'm realizing, no, the glow is God. Why did I love all those things? It wasn't the giant numbers or the specific stories that are no longer true. No, it's like, I love God. And that's what makes that glowing. God is here. Now. He wants to say that. And then he wants to say, be strong and let's go to work. That's how you love me. I'm here. And that's enough. You know, this is the only common denominator for God's people throughout the years. I mean, otherwise it's completely not fair. If we just live for the results and the results are the reward of our work, then it's just not fair to Jeremiah. Poor guy. His whole work was to speak for God to the people of Israel. You're so bad. God's going to bring the Babylonians and they're going to destroy you. It's like, excuse me, I'd rather live at a different time. Can I come back in the book of Acts when God's like launching the church? What if I was born in the 400 years of slavery in Egypt and I was one of God's people and I was supposed to serve him then? What would the work be like then compared? Or, or let's take today. What if it, God assigned you to the work in the Muslim world versus in the Hispanic world? It's not fair if there's not a common denominator that it's not only about the result, but first it's about experiencing God. Otherwise, it's just, it's just not fair. I'll never forget my dad, at the height of his ministry in Virginia Beach, Norfolk, back in the 70s, went on a mission trip for six weeks. And a pastor on his church staff had been a leader for Wycliffe Bible Translators. His name was Maury Cottle. And he said, look, I've got all these connections. You really need to see the body of Christ. You need to meet God's people around the world. So you come with me. And they went to Greece and Philippines and Hong Kong. And they stayed away over Christmas. It was a huge sacrifice. He lost like 50 pounds and, and all that, which he needed to lose. But that's okay, Dad. Okay, you're up in heaven. Sorry about that. So... He, come, he came back, and the first Sunday he tried to talk about his trip, he couldn't because he started to cry. And he never did that. So the people were just freaking out. What has got him so upset? And it's because he was trying to talk about a girl in our church that he had dedicated as a baby who was now serving as a nurse in a hospital in northern Pakistan called Bach Hospital. And that was one of the places they visited, and he went and saw Nancy Pretzman. He knew the director of the hospital, Caleb Cuthrell, and Caleb's son, Luke, that, by the way, Nancy married, and now she's Nancy Cuthrell. But she was out there, and Dad visited her, and he said, Dean, he said it was a, or he told us all in the church, said it was a God-forsaken place. He said, I put everything I packed in my suitcase on, and I still was freezing cold. And there were no showers, no hot water, except ice-cold showers. And so he said, it really is where he cried. He said, well, first he said, they let in 100 patients every morning from the line of Muslim people, desperate enough to come to a Christian hospital for, for help. And then they would minister and treat them as best they could and then give them the gospel message. And um, the thing that, that got him so emotional was he said, Nancy, you know, when she grew up in our church and our Christian school, she was always so pretty and concerned about her appearance. 
And he said, watching her serve in the hospital, he said, she had no makeup on, her hair, her face was, was unkempt, very dirty. But he said she didn't care. She had such a strength, such a passion for these people. And then when they got together, the whole staff met with my dad and with Maury Cottle and the, the main leaders of the staff. They asked my dad, they said, you're a great Bible teacher. Do you know the story where Jesus tells his evangelists that if the people in the town don't believe them, that they can shake the dust off their feet and say your judgment be on your own head? They go, how do you know when that time comes? How can we know? Because nobody has responded to us. We're doing this every day. When can we shake the dust off our feet? My dad was so like, you're asking me this? You're the first stringers in the kingdom of God. You're the A team. He goes, only the God who's called you out here, so obviously called you out here to do this work, could tell you the answer to that question. And then when he tried to talk about it back in Virginia Beach, he, he couldn't talk about it, especially Nancy. And it wasn't because he felt sorry for her. It wasn't because he was like, I wish she had a better assignment. Oh my gosh, can't believe she's in this hospital. No, somebody very close range who grew up in his midst, young person, looked and proved to him, look at what you can do in adverse circumstances. Look at the strength God can give you to serve when nothing is happening. Even, of course, we desire it every day while we be out here. Of course we want the result. But if the result is not coming, and there's that particular season, which is for many of us, most of our days, is there a greater strength? And, of course, they proved it. Oh, sure. It's not the condition of the work. It's the Lord of the work. And when you labor, he says, I am with you. So if it's wooden cement or if it's this gorgeous temple, what's the difference? You got me. You know, it's interesting. Solomon, he built that amazing temple and then his heart went to idolatry and most of his life he didn't care about God at all and lived a life of regret. And then there was a civil war and most of the kings were bad, were evil. So they didn't really enjoy God in that amazing temple like they did under King David when they just had a tent when they just had a temporary structure, a tabernacle. And I was thinking even before that, Enoch, you know, he didn't have either one. And it says he was so close to God and he walked with God and experienced God so much. One day God said, hey, come on home to my house. You don't have to die. You could just, and Enoch was not, it says, because he walked with God. He had nothing. And God was enough for him. God's like, hey, it's me. I'm with you. Do the work for me while you're waiting for the result. And I'll do that in my time. Hey, I'm here. I, my spirit is with you according to the covenant, even though you don't deserve it. I'm here. And then you can love me like never before. And you think back to that long relationship. It's like I could have, I could have, I could have such a sweet part of that in the work. And it's not about the result. It's a tough thing for veterans. We compare. I know for me, I compare and get discouraged. I compare this service to last service. I compare oh, me to the minister down the street, me to my past. And God's like, why are you even thinking like that? This year to last year's results or whatever. I'm here. It's about me. And so then the last thing he says is, and I know that you can't get away from that desire for result. And so that's my second promise. And the rest of the message will be just this last point is briefer. Um, the last promise, the second promise is I will bring the glory. I will bring the glory. And it starts in verse six. This is what the Lord Almighty says. And you'll notice the Lord Almighty is in every verse and twice in the last verse. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while and once more, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord 
Almighty, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So he's looking at these people, these older people, and he's saying, what's your hang up, man? You're poor, right? That's what it is. You're refugees. You don't have the money to do what Solomon did. How in the world could you build a thing like that? Because you don't have all his money, right? Yeah, well, the silver and the gold are mine. Oh, and by the way, who's got the money? Oh, Persia, that's right. Yeah, they can afford to build the nice buildings. Yeah, well, I'm going to shake them. And I'm going to shake all the nations, the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, like a baby shaking a rattle. And I'll bring them here and they will come here with their wealth. And I, I will fill this house with glory. And that's like, if you could hear God say that to your spirit, whatever you're missing, whatever you think, I just, I can't do it. I used to have, I don't have it. I, don't, I wish I had it. I, I don't have it. I, 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 it's just, I'm out of it. And God's like, I have it. What's ultimately discouraging you that you don't have it, you can't do? I can do it. And I'm talking to you, God says, I promise you in my time, I will make your work worth every minute, every penny. Every ounce of energy you spend, God says, you will rejoice forever in heaven that you gave every ounce of energy because ultimately, when we go out of time, and time doesn't sequence, don't even matter, you will see all your work goes into this millennial temple that I will build. It will be a different day. And I need you to track with me because forget the result, leave the results to me in my time. And God then, this is just the part of God where he breathes into us promises all through in, in, in the Bible. He's promising and trying to get us to be hopeful and look forward to things. And, and, and in our spirit and our spirit, he's like coming to us every day if we let him. And he's like, oh, you're letting me be strong and you're working for me? Okay, now, now, when, when you least expect it and stuff, I'm just going to whisper to you. And I'm going to put this little picture in your mind, this little image, this tantalizing image of what things could be. You're staring at a before picture, Dean. You're staring at a before picture, all, all of us when we work for God. And he's like, whatever it is, this is what it could be. This is what it will be in my time. And even more specifically to our areas of work, he can give us those, those visions, those pictures. And we live, we live for that image, that vision. We work in the hope of that vision and we smile at the before picture. I never forget when I first started in, in ministry, it was youth ministry, and the guy before me had burned out because the kids were strong leaders and clowns and rambunctious. There was about 80 high schoolers, and he couldn't control them, and he didn't have relationships with them, and he just couldn't lead them from the front. They were always taking over and making them, everybody laugh at him, and he has got burned out, so he left. And the first couple of weeks after I got there, it was a sunny morning. We're all sitting around, about 80 high schoolers, and up front was a couple girl, high school girls singing with a mic and a, a, a man, an adult leader playing guitar and, eight, and 80 kids that didn't care. 80 kids on Sunday morning that were oblivious to what was going on on the stage. And instead, because that wasn't creative, they were getting major creative and they were showing their prom pictures to one another and they were laughing at jokes and they were, the whole energy was completely blind. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is gonna be me now. I'm going to be on the stage, and they're going to do this to me. And their whole ex potential experience of God is just going to be this way. And I, and I was just starting to get like, oh, my gosh. And I remember my heart just started burning. And I, I started feeling like, I know what I need to do. I'm going to be like Jesus when he stood up, and he cleansed the temple, and he turned the tables over, and he whipped, got his whip out. And I'm just going to get up, and I'm going to tell him, you better stop that, put those pictures away, and shut up, and love God, and come here to do what me think. And a uh, little red alarm bell going off in my head. Head. It's like, you know, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> I know you feel like that's what you want to do, like John 3.16 and the Holy Spirit, but I don't think that's the Holy Spirit. You know, and I'll never forget, and I can't remember exactly the words or the picture or what it was. All I knew is, is that all went away, and I calmed down. I felt that sort of paralyzing discouragement leave me in one image of what they could be. I wish I could tell you I had different images, what it exactly was on that morning. 
But God gave me some image of what it could be, and I remember God's like, now you smile at them. You smile at them, showing their prom pictures, not caring about the leadership. You smile at them, completely don't care about God. You love them. You build relationships with them, and in your heart, you think and you remember this picture. I'll never forget it. And I was able to do it. It was a God thing. It was like, and, and, I, and I didn't have to make that same mistake and alienate them all. And then it was, um, this is always the mystery part is when God does the results. In this case, it was very soon. It was two or three months later, we went on a mission trip and we're all in the, packed into one hotel room in Monterey, Mexico. And there was 25 kids, most of the leaders, the older ones. And we were singing songs, worship songs, and they heard their voices sing in that little room and they liked the sound of it and they wanted to do it and keep doing it. And they did it for the whole 16 day trip. And they brought that back and it was the hot coals, made it the peer pressure, made it the thing to do, to respect, to know that's what we're doing. They did that. And for seven years when I was there, we had the most amazing worship times with high schoolers in their living rooms. 80 kids in a living room, just experiencing God, you know? And I'm, I just know the important part is can you smile at the before picture? Can God show you something? Well, it can be, not what you're gonna do, no. What only he can do in his time. And then he gives you the courage and the strength to, to work for him. This is the message from Haggai. So much more important than making God's work a priority is staying encouraged in the work. And for so many of us, uh, this is what the Lord wants to say to us today. Now, last week, I gave you a card, and we've included it again in the bulletin. For those of you who weren't here last week or didn't have a chance to do that, you would still like to do that. I got 150 of them in. So many of them were turned in, which is great. But I know that 30% of the people aren't here on any given Sunday. So something this important, I want to offer two Sundays in a row. One of the key ways that we help build God's house together is give. And that's a huge thing between us and God as we love him is our giving. And so the card in your bulletin gives you three boxes to check. One is, yes, Dean, I've already made the commitment to give to God in an appropriate amount, which we suggest is 10%. But that's a very personal thing between you and God. The second one is, yes, I'm beginning to make this commitment or pray for me as I make this commitment. That's the middle box. And the last one is, I would like to pursue wisdom through taking the course Financial Peace, you know, learn some tools, get a plan for my finances, turn them back, right set up, get out of debt, make a budget, whatever. Those were uh, commitments we offered last week. If you didn't get a chance and you would like to uh, make that commitment, you can check one of those boxes or whichever ones would apply to you, sign it, print your name, and fold it, and just write Pastor Dean on it, and drop it in the offering today, and I will receive see that. No one else will see that information. I know it's very personal and some of you don't even want to do this and you're still making that commitment. I get that. Um, but, but the reason I'm calling for this is it's a very specific thing we do for God for his house. And I would love to pray with you uh, and encourage you in that commitment. Uh, uh, I'll just drop you a note and let you know that I'm praying for you. So, um, Again, today, uh, that's there for you if you'd like to uh, take that card and then uh, drop it to me if God would lead you to do that. Uh, but now, let's, let's, uh, before we worship, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for your word, your spirit, the joy of doing your work, our way of loving you. Um, thank you for empowering us and, and uh, being with us even when we, don't, when we don't deserve it. Thank you for what we can hope in you to do, for the hopeful way we can approach our labor for recruiting us and giving such a wonderful job to do until we see you in heaven. Oh, by your spirit, Lord, uh, speak to our church that we might be a, a place where many serve you with great joy and love you from, with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. We thank you now as we turn to, to worship and to Jesus that he was the ultimate example of this work uh, that was for you and was str strong and to the end. Bless us now, Lord, in these next few minutes, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.